so proud to be here this morning. Um, my name is Laura Hoffman, and I am the department chair of, of the Emeritus Institute. My area is, is fine, applied, and performance art. And I also teach photography and art appreciation. And I have had the pleasure of serving as the faculty moderator over the last three years. And today I am standing in for my colleague, Eva Marie Rodriguez Morris, who is the faculty moderator um, for just this week only. So thank you for having me. And today it is my honor to introduce today's lecturer. And I'm gonna be telling you about him. And this is for the Dorothy Marie Laurie Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. And the whole idea is to have in-depth lectures on a wide variety of topics. So I just wanna let a few people in. Um, as I see the numbers rolling, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, all right, so today, um, about Mr. Samuel Snodgrass, um, who is joining us today. Uh, the topic is on the history of global fashion. And his research is object and exhibition based, often concerning wearable objects and their histories. His interests range from 18th century Italian opera to 20th century athletic wear to queerness throughout history. Born and raised in Springfield, Missouri, he received a BFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago and his MA from the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. And he is coming to us from New York City. He currently serves as a professor in the History of Art Department at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, New York. And he is the museum educator at the Frick Collection and has presented his research as a panelist with the Chicago Fashion Lyceum and Association of Dress Historians. In addition to conducting written and object based research, Mr. Snodgrass is a hat maker trained in traditional millinery, tailoring, and textile creation techniques. And as always, we invite you to continue to submit your insightful questions at the end of the talk in the chat, and we'll have an, a time for questions and answers um, with Mr. Samuel Snodgrass. So I am proud to welcome you, um, Mr. Samuel Snodgrass. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much, Laura. All right, I'm just going to share my screen. OK, uh, you can see this. Absolutely. You're good to go. Great. Thank you. Um, so I am Samuel Snodgrass. I'm a professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and I also work in education at the Frick Collection. Uh, my academic work falls within the field of fashion history, but uh, I explore that through a lens of art history, and most of what I study looks at clothing and dress practices uh, and what that, that can tell us about people from a different time or a different place. Um, dress as part of culture is definitely connected to every other part of culture. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about global fashion history, but specifically uh, I've chosen two case studies um, in Africa that we can look at today. Um, so just an overview of um, kind of the structure of my talk today. Um, I teach a, a course on global fashion history at FIT, uh, which looks at the non-Western world uh, from ancient times to the 20th century. So it's very much a global survey of fashion history. Uh, so we do three weeks on Africa, three weeks on the Americas, four weeks on Asia, and then one on Oceania. Uh, and there's a whole other class on European and United States fashion history. Um, so it's, there's quite a lot um, to cover. But for today, I've decided to focus on two case studies from Africa. Uh, but first, I'll give a brief overview of why fashion history has typically ignored Africa and other parts of the world. 
Um, before we get into our case studies, uh, I'll talk about a process known as cultural authentication. Uh, and then of course, we'll end with some questions. So how has fashion history been written? Uh, on the screen, we're looking at three plates from what is considered the first fashion history book. Uh, it was by Cesar Vecellio, uh, called Ancient, Moder Ancient and Modern Habits, from uh, published between 1562 and 1601. Uh, there's multiple uh, printings of this book. And habits is just uh, an older word for clothing. Um, your, your habit was what you wore and how you presented yourself throughout the day. Uh, and this book covered the entire world. Uh, it had prints uh, documenting what people were wearing in as much of the world as had been uh, explored or discovered by Italians at this time. Vecelli is uh, coming from Italy. There's over 500 plates depicting dress from around the world. Uh, and it chron chronicles what people wore at that moment in um, the 1500s, but also what they wore in the past. So documenting a history of dress uh, before the present time. Uh, on the left, we're looking at a print from uh, America, from what is now Virginia. Uh, this is in the second edition, which is in 1598. In the middle is a print from China, so depicting Chinese dress at the time. And then on the right are admirals and advisors to the Sultan of Turkey at the time. Um, moving a bit forward in time, uh, eventually in the 18th century, we get the Enlightenment. And Enlightenment thinking uh, or reorganizes the world into what are known as Cart Cartesian dualities, which are named after Rene Descartes. Uh, this is an attempt to put the world into easily defined categories, uh, and each category is then complemented by its opposite, and I've listed a few here, so mind versus body, male versus female, rational, emotional, and so on, um, that these things um, are the opposite. Uh, this leaves very little space for the gray area in between. Uh, there's an abandoning of a religion at this time, which leads people to find new explanations for who they are and what is their place in the world uh, and how do they fit in relationship with everything else in the world. Uh, this is a, a move to describe the way things are. And this line of thinking defines the gender roles and stereotypes that we still have today. Uh, so this, uh, the Enlightenment tradition really um, is still with us. It, it, it's uh, the thinking that is the founding of the United States. Um, so these ideas really uh, continue long after this period. Uh, leading to um, passages like this. So this is Charles Blanc writing on art and ornament and dress in 1875. And what he says, he says, among primitive nations who are more natural, younger, and more under the sway of feeling, the man is almost as fond of color as the woman. The savage, finding himself doubtless too much of one color, seeks to embellish himself by tattooing. The chief makes himself a headdress with feathers of brilliant tints. The Moor, the Negro, the Arab, and the Indian deck themselves with startling hues. But wherever civilization becomes intricate and develops, man abandons color to woman. He himself becomes colorless and somber. And in the present day throughout Europe, he is dressed in black. So there's a lot of things going on in this passage. Uh, Charles Blanc is uh, from Britain. And he's saying that non-Western people are just like women, that they're consumed with a love of color and decoration, and that they're more under the sway of feeling. Uh, so he is really exhibiting quite a bit of bias here. Um, saying that the, these primitive nations, quote unquote, um, are, are not as developed as Europe. Um, and kind of throwing in a bit of misogynist ideas, saying that women are not as developed as men here as well. Uh, so there's a lot of um, bias that's coming through. Uh, he's saying that while white men have supposedly 
uh, evolved beyond these frivolous cares of fashion that um, that they wear black and they're very somber, that they don't need to uh, adorn themselves in, in, in other ways. Uh, but in reality, um, European men, men everywhere care about fashion all along. The, the, this is total uh, false. Uh, this is nothing about this passage is true, uh, but it is the way that people are uh, viewing the non-Western world at this period. And what leads to uh, books like this, so this is a timeline from a fashion history textbook. Uh, this textbook gets used by a lot of schools when teaching uh, fashion history courses. And so I'll kind of point out what is really going on um, here. Uh, the first row, the top row here, um, it starts with an ancient Greek uh, ensemble. And then the next ensemble jumps to the 14th century. Uh, so there's hundreds of years uh, being skipped right here. Uh, this, the reason that they make this jump uh, and kind of choose the 14th century as this like starting point for European fashion corresponds with the invention of the English word for fashion, uh, which comes from the Latin to make. But there, there are much older words for fashion. The Romans even had a word for fashion, which was modo, uh, which is then uh, taken by the French uh, and they have la mode is the word for fashion in French. Uh, going down the rows, um, every example you see is European with a few American exceptions. Um, every example you see is kind of the upper echelon, the most elite, the most wealthy um, dress of the time period. Uh, they're exclusively dresses as well. Um, so fashion is defined by uh, the female, um, the there, there's no acknowledgement that men could even be considered uh, part of fashion in this uh, timeline. Uh, and then the last two rows here uh, take up just the past 200 years. Um, and so they have two full rows just for, for 200 years. Um, so really ignoring um, most of human history here. Uh, the global dress history that, uh, that I teach uh, it has been ignored by mainstream fashion history and was often in the hands of social scientists and anthropologists. Um, for a while, these were the only people who had an interest in dress practices, uh, but they would often view clothing as uh, just clothing that is not part of a fashion system. Uh, Non-Western people have been described as wearing uh, what they have always worn, that their dress doesn't change over time, that when an anthropologist would visit um, someplace in Africa or someplace in Asia, uh, they describe the dress as if it is finite and that it hasn't evolved over time, that what they have, that what they're wearing in that moment, that they're encountering these people has been what they've always worn. Anthropological texts often frame all indigenous clothing as either traditional or modernized and what they wear after Western in integration or, um, or colonization. Uh, so it's kind of grouped into these two categories. It's either traditional or it's modernized, civilized uh, Western clothes. And I'm definitely using civilized in, um, in air quotes here. The way anthropology is written can also make a culture seem very alien or strange. There's a drive to point out the differences and often ignore um, similarities too. However, there are um, people who are trying to change this. Um, in the past um, 20 years, there's been a push to rethink what is fashion and how can we define it in a more inclusive way and look at changes over time in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, and one great example, uh, which I'm kind of using as um, a framework for, for this talk, uh, comes from the um, social scientist, Joanne Ecker and Tonya Erkoizna. And uh, these two uh, scholars define um, 
a process known as cultural authentication. And cultural authentication is a process used to explain how styles are adopted from outside influences and become authentically part of a new culture. So an exchange of ideas from one place to another. Um, again, this is pushing back against the idea that uh, non-Western cultures um, are kind of submissive to colonial uh, powers and that their dress changes because of these colonial powers. Um, cultural authentication tries to acknowledge uh, the agency of these non-Western cultures and kind of the choice that they have in adopting a different style. And it's broken up into uh, four steps. The first step is selection. So an object, idea, or technique is selected out of many possibilities presented by another culture. A particular external cultural practice or product is selected as appropriate and desirable by members of another culture. And out of this almost unlimited number of cultural options um, or offerings, so there, there's some desirable aspect, while many other offerings are not as desirable. The next step is characterization. And this is when the selected item is characterized within the framework of the receiving society. So the form is renamed or translated, literally translated into the new language to fit within uh, the new culture. Uh, this could also be a translation of function too. Um, a great example is um, when uh, Europeans arrive in the North American continent and they meet Native Americans and they start trading um, cloth and clothing. And so you have Native Americans wearing uh, European shirts, kind of like the shirt I'm wearing, the kind of a collar with buttons, uh, but they're wearing it in ways that Europeans would never wear them, that they're kind of mixing uh, different layers of clothing uh, so this is characterization, that the function has been translated in some way. The third step is incorporation. So when the innovation comes to satisfy a new need within the society, so an object, symbol, or text, or garment uh, from somewhere else occupies a functional role within the receiving culture. So that's, and this can either be at the individual level that it um, satisfies the need for a single person or a collective level that um, the uh, proliferation of a, a garment, say Western style shirts, um, fits a need within an entire community rather than just one person. Uh, but oftentimes it's at both. And I, I think the two examples I've brought, um, you'll see that uh, it works on both levels, both the individual and the kind of larger community level. The fourth step is transformation. So the form has been completely integrated and no longer seems foreign. This entails an accommodation of its old form and purpose into the new setting in a holistic way that the outcome of this final phase invariably involves a creative or artistic change um, that envelops the new product and, and setting. And with all of this, I, I think it's really important to note that expressions of ethnicity or culture are never fixed, uh, that these symbols are available from a culture, from, from both its past and its present. Uh, and these are not permanent points of tradition, uh, but rather frames of reference and meaning within which ethnics respond to social, political, religious, or economic pressures. Uh, and the adoption of Western dress within a non-Western location uh, is much more than just a sign of colonial domination. Uh, cultural authentication acknowledges the agency and the choice that receiving cultures have. So our first case study starts with a textile known as Indian Madras. This is a light cotton uh, textile 
um, typically made in plaid and is named after the city of Madras in southern India. Uh, the city is known for its textile production. You, Although Madras is typically plaid, you do see florals, you see calico prints, uh, you see it embroidered. Um, but kind of the main characteristics are that it's very lightweight and it's made of cotton. These textiles have been made since the 1500s, making them some of the oldest textiles in the cotton trade. The plaid pattern may be traditional um, to Indian weavers who produce the cloth, or this could also be a uh, product of British imposition. Uh, there's kind of evidence for both um, that it's likely that Indian weavers were already making versions of plaid, uh, but then became more popular as um, the British um, started to colonize India. Uh, for the locals of Madras, the textile is not the most valuable. It's actually um, one of the cheaper cloths that, that have been made there, um, but it became a very highly prized um, in other parts of the world um, as a traded good, that it, it becomes much more valuable as an export to people outside of India. This is the same textile that eventually makes it to the United States through the transatlantic slave trade and becomes associated with the preppy look um, that you have kind of Ivy League men wearing these plaid shirts uh, or plaid suits. Um, it kind of makes its way around the world and gets associated um, with different things in different locations. But that uh, that's a story for another day. Um, this cloth was initially traded by the Portuguese merchants. So the Portuguese are some of the earliest uh, to uh, earliest within the, the age of exploration. So they have established trade ports um, in a lot of uh, in a lot of areas around Africa and around India. So they become the first to trade this cloth and they take it to North Africa, West Asia, and eventually alongside the transatlantic slave trade into West Africa. And so I'm gonna zoom in and focus on West Africa here. Uh, although this textile is spreading um, really all over the world at this time too. Uh, so people in Southern Nigeria call the fabric Injiri or George. Uh, the George name comes from uh, Fort St. George, which is the port in Madras that these uh, that this cloth was once exported from. Uh, so it's named after the, the, the port city or the port that it's being traded from. And we're looking at two photos of Igbo people from the early 20th century. Um, they're both um, exhibiting uh, Madras. They're wearing it in a couple of different ways. Um, this, they would have called it injiri, and the cloth is uh, it's sacred as, as a symbol of this trade and prestige. Uh, so we see two people um, wearing it both as a, a skirt and kind of draped over the shoulders too. On the right, we see it uh, draped around the waist um, as if it's kind of like a sash or something. And then also uh, a few pieces draped around, along the shoulders too. Also in Nigeria are the Kalabari people, and they obtained Madras textiles through the same trade that's going on, but they did not simply turn this textile into clothing. They transformed it in a very unique way. They create what is called Palita Bita, uh, which is translated as literally cut cloth or cut thread cloth. And this is a textile that is made by removing sec selected threads from these Indian Madras textiles to create a wholly new design and look to the fabric. This art is practiced by predominantly Kalabari women. Uh, it's kind of the tradition for the woman of the household to um, go through this, uh, this process. We even have um, the name of one uh, woman. Um, most of these textiles don't have an associated artist with them, but this, uh, the red example from the Dallas Art Museum does have a, a named maker, um, which is very uh, special to have. 
Um, they're not exclusively women. Um, there are cases of um, men uh, making cut thread cloth or um, also young girls as well. Uh, but it is interesting that older women within the society act as the fashion arbiters, that they, they are the tastemakers. Uh, so they dictate what the rest of the community can wear. Uh, they have a relatively strict dress code within the Calabari people. Uh, so not only is the textile itself coming from India, but the tools used to cut the threads, they have needles, they have pen knives, they have razor blades. Um, these are also items that are uh, acquired through trade. Uh, so this is not only is the textile um, kind of the, the base, uh, an object of trade, but even the ability to cut the threads is the product of trade, that they, they don't have uh, the same materials available to them. The, the needles and, and razor blades are likely coming from somewhere in Europe. Um, here we see an example of how this textile would be worn. So it's kind of wrapped around the waist multiple times. These are very long textiles. Uh, on the previous slide, uh, this red one is, I think, 26 feet long. Uh, so I'm really only showing you a very small section of this cloth. Uh, that it would be wrapped uh, many, many times around the waist. Uh, and then kind of a, a feature of it is that you see the different layers of the wrapping going around, uh, that having this length of cloth is, is showing prestige and showing wealth. Uh, I'm also showing you some of the very typical uh, patterns um, that can be made. Uh, they're often named after everyday objects. So you have a uh, wine glass tail, you have one that's called mat or carpet, uh, you have one called chain, fish gill is a very popular one. Uh, so all of these uh, patterns can be combined um, really at the discretion of the artist, the person who's cutting the threads. And there are versions where sometimes you're cutting the light colored threads of a cloth and sometimes you're cutting the dark colored threads. And that will give you a different appearance. Uh, you could have the same Indian madras, and depending on what you cut, you get a different pattern with the with what threads you cut. And a lot of this is up to personal taste. That each artist has their own uh, patterns that they like. That is not really uh, prescribed um, what patterns to use. Um, so this is a quintessential example of cultural authentication. Uh, these textiles started as uh, trade goods from India, and then through trade by the Portuguese, uh, get selected by the Calabari people and subsequently are transformed to fulfill an expressive need, to fulfill this kind of artistic need to alter something that they have uh, acquired from somewhere else. So, Although the Palita Bite starts as Madras, uh, the two textiles are distinctly different, both in appearance um, and in function as well. Uh, Palita Bite is an authentically Calabari textile, although, or, or despite the fact that it, it comes from somewhere else uh, and is reliant on uh, the trade with other places. Moving a bit further south and a bit further east. Uh, so the Calabari people are over here in the uh, Niger River um, Delta. And we're gonna be moving to our, our next case study, which is taking place in the Bamboon Kingdom, uh, which is right here in Cameroon. So we we're just in Nigeria, now we're moving into Cameroon. And focusing specifically on the kingdom of Bamun and specifically King Ibrahim and Joya, uh, who became ruler of the Bamun kingdom in Cameroon in the mid 1880s. Uh, and we see him on the right here. So rather than be invaded by German colonizers, Njoya voluntarily put the Bamun kingdom under the protection of col the colonial, uh, German colonial power. 
And he used this as an opportunity to modernize or westernize certain elements of his society. Uh, we see him here posing for the cameras of several German visitors to his kingdom. He took pictures of himself using a camera acquired from these visitors. So he's uh, very interested in new technologies, one of which is um, the camera, uh, but he also establishes schools for um, uh, the children of his kingdom to learn German, uh, that he's very um, interested in uh, kind of European uh, political power and is really a collaborator with the Germans at this period. Um, so he uses technology to his benefit in a lot of ways, uh, specifically with photography, um, but kind of uses the um, the Germans as protection. Uh, so he has uh, German soldiers uh, protecting his kingdom from uh, his neighbors. Uh, in all of the photographs that Enjoya is depicted in, uh, we see that he um, is very attuned to how he's presenting himself. Um, his dress indicates that he presented himself with great care. Uh, he's very clearly aware, like many successful rulers, of the effectiveness of clothing as a tool for communicating and enhancing his own status. Enjoya presided over dress innovations that offered him new means of visually declaring his power in both uh, local audience and to Western visitors. Uh, so here we see him sitting on his throne um, with kind of his uh, local attendants. Uh, and they all seem to be dressed in a similar way um, that he is, although his dress may have a bit more ornamentation uh, than the others in the background. Um, and do take a quick look at the throne that he's sitting on. I'll, I'll come back to the throne in a second. Um, but just to notice kind of the, the textures going on here, the shapes um, and kind of the figures that are going on on the throne, because uh, the throne is a, a very significant uh, symbol for him. Uh, here we see him flanked by his two sons. Um, so he's in the middle here, uh, flanked by two princes. And you'll notice that one of them has a slightly different uh, attire on. Uh, and I'll point out why that is in just a second. Uh, because most of the photographs that Enjoya wears uh, are these long, flowing, richly embroidered robes. Uh, this clothing that to the eye of non-local observers, um, much like myself, uh, I'm not from uh, Ben Moon, uh, these appear to epitomize traditional African dress. Uh, in fact, uh, on closer examination of this style of dress reveals that its appearance in Ben Moon was the result of uh, specific historical changes. So this dress style that he's wearing is not their traditional clothing. This is not what Ben Moon people had been wearing uh, for years previous to Enjoya's rule. Um, he does change the, the dress. Um, and so I point out the, uh, the sun on his right, uh, because this is more of the typical attire that they would have been wearing in years prior to uh, Enjoya's rule. Um, but he changes the, the nation's dress. And the dress that he changes the nation to comes from the Hausa people. And the, the Hausa people are just to the north of uh, Bamun. So Enjoya is taking inspiration from, uh, for his dress from the nobles of this neighboring kingdom. He looked to the Hausa people who lived uh, just to the north in Nigeria. And typical Hausa textiles are dyed with indigo, and they can be very dark indigo, as we see. Uh, this example almost looks uh, completely black, um, but it is um, a deep, deep indigo dye. 
Uh, you can also get a good sense of the indigo in this first image I showed that this um, it's almost shiny in a way because of the amount of dye that is in um, this dark cloth. Uh, also, he's wearing it around his head as a turban. Uh, but house address um, consists of these loose flowing gowns and loose trousers. The gowns have wide openings on both sides for ventilation. Uh, the trousers are relatively loose around the waist and at the top. Um, but rather tight around the the lower legs. Um, you can kind of see how they're they're cinched at, at, at around the the ankles. Uh, the they also wear leather sandals and turbans are also kind of the typical headdress uh, on top. Uh, the men wear an elaborate, large flowing gown known as a baban riga or bubu. Um, there's many names for this kind of uh, gown that they're wearing on top, uh, but I think boo-boo is the most uh, typically used one. Uh, these large flowing gowns usually feature elaborate embroidery designs that are around the neck and the chest area. Uh, you'll often uh, hear uh, this pattern referred to as the drum and knife pattern, um, but that is kind of a, uh, a European interpretation of this design. Uh, it really is not supposed to be pictorial at all. So these, these are not knives, although they're kind of pointy shapes. Uh, and this is not a drum, even though it is a circular shape. Um, but if you are out there reading uh, anthropological texts, this will be referred to as a drum and knife embroidery pattern. Uh, but these are not supposed to be representational at all, that these are kind of abstracted shapes. Um, you also notice this uh, cross motif in the very center of this image. Uh, this cross is um, uh, the symbol for the House of People. Uh, so if you look at the House of People, you'll, you'll often see this, uh, uh, this cross uh, emblem. Uh, this attire is voluminous, untailored, um, but adorned with these embroidered motifs. Uh, the pants have drawstrings uh, and these kind of elaborately draped turbans as well. Uh, this is all the dress of the very high status, uh, that having a wealth of cloth, having these loosely draped clothing um, represents wealth, that cloth is actually a very um, precious object uh, and to have a lot of it represents your wealth and your status here. Uh, the, the Hausa were also prominent traders in the region, uh, and therefore they had kind of an economic power um, over their neighbors, that they were very wealthy people uh, because of the centralized trade that they were participating in. Uh, and they would often use that power against uh, some of their neighboring kingdoms. Uh, so it's very interesting that Enjoya would adopt this style of dress uh, to become... Um, to, to get this a similar look as uh, who are essentially his enemies. Um, on top of this, and kind of in addition, in addition to spreading goods through trade, uh, the Hausa um, were, they also practice Islam and the spread of their religion is also happening um, as they're spreading goods through trade, they're spreading their religion uh, to these neighboring kingdoms. And while Islam had been widespread in Hausa land since the 14th century, Bamun continued to practice indigenous religions um, that they uh, did not um, convert to Islam despite these outside pressures. That is until uh, King Njoya comes to power again in the 1880s. Uh, he converts his kingdom to Islam. And with this adoption of uh, a new religion, came the adoption of new dress practices, that these things are related, that Islam has uh, rules of uh, covering the body in certain ways uh, for modesty, uh, that the, the new religion comes with a new practice in dress. Uh, so when the nobles of Bamun and neighboring kingdoms adopted them, the house of robes were effectively transformed into local dress. Uh, that they kind of abandoned their previous traditional dress. Thus, these 
uh, Bamoon robes are rooted in these imported styles, that they're not entirely local to the region. Uh, they were absorbed into these local practice, though, through decades of use, uh, and then they were modified to suit Bamun tastes and techniques. So you won't really see the house across on a Bamun example, uh, but you'll see the, the rest of um, the embroidery designs. To make things a bit more complicated, uh, enjoy a is seen in other photographs wearing a very, very different kind of dress, um, a very different form of high prestige attire. Uh, to Western eyes, this style of dress is immediately recognizable as imported. Uh, we're seeing a European style military dress uniform. It's been tightly tailored uh, with buttons and ornamental braids. Uh, so this is very different. Uh, these. Uh, the kind of the house of style robes uh, would never be cut or, or sewn, whereas a military uniform, you're cutting into the cloth and sewing it together. You're tailoring this jacket. Uh, European military uniforms are today nearly universal symbols of power. In Enjoya's day, the style of dress was associated with the growing power of European residents. So the Germans who um, are visiting um, and kind of trying to, to gain power at the dawn of the colonial era. And rather than wholesale borrowing, uh, the Ban Moon version of a German uniform has been subtly adapted to a new context. Um, and Joya's garments are made by local tailors. So he's not just taking a pre-made German uniform. He's having his local tailors make the same version. Uh, and significantly, they incorporated beads in place of the braided ornamentation of the of German uniforms. Uh, so all of this um, decoration that we see on his uh, uniform uh, in both of these images, I know it's difficult to see. And unfortunately, I don't have a, a good close-up image of the beads on Enjoya's uniform. I don't even know if one exists. Um, I don't believe these garments have survived either, so we can't actually look at these surviving garments. Uh, but we do know from kind of uh, oral histories and records that he did have uh, all of the ornamentation and kind of metals made uh, in beadwork. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't really get a good sense of what it looked like. Um, but I do have um, some other beaded objects from Ben Moon to get a sense of what it might have looked like. Uh, so here we see a helmet mask uh, from 1880, so um, or before 1880, so kind of an earlier um, example, uh, and then a, a stool um, that was around the time that Enjoya was in rule. Uh, and these are using both uh, European and European glass beads. So again, beads that have been traded from somewhere else and uh, these uh, shell beads that are, are local. Uh, and the use of certain materials like these beads uh, were under the monopoly of the monarch. Um, so he had complete control over beadwork uh, and he used them as a symbol of power. Uh, other people could only use or wear beads if they were gifted from the king. Uh, and this would indicate, if you were to wear beads, it would indicate that you had a relationship with the king, that you were part of his court or working under him in some way. And therefore, the Bamun king's throne, which I mentioned earlier, is considered an excellent example of political art uh, at the service of his power. Uh, the Bamun throne consists of several solid pieces of assembled wood, uh, but then lined in a mesh of European glass beads and these cowrie shells. Uh, and the stool on the scene is made in a very similar way um, that his throne would have been made in. Uh, the king himself was the sole authority on what styles of art objects could be produced. Um, so he's indicating what objects he wants to be made. Um, and which works could be gifted um, either to uh, kind of his local attendants, or he would say uh, these objects can go to the colonial regime, that the Germans can have these objects. 
Um, he's also indicating what artisans would be involved in the exchange. So what artisans are allowed to make something and cover it with beads, uh, and then who can who can sell it or exchange it with um, other people. Uh, so the beadwork is this royal art that is is under the control of the monarch. Um, and Joy would have had total control over beadwork. So because beads are the medium uh, most closely associated with the royal arts of Bamun, Enjoya's transformation of German braiding into beads. So he's not, uh, we see some German braiding here. Uh, he's not taking that symbol. He's now making it into beads. Uh, it's particularly meaningful in this cultural context. Uh, because beadwork as an important symbol of this royal power within Bamun uh, is also recognized by his neighboring kingdoms. So it, it's, it's not only a symbol of power within his kingdom, but to his neighbors um, surrounding him. So rather than copying the German uniform, uh, Enjoya and his collaborators have subtly transformed their, their suit um, to meet a, an, a context of their own visual language of power uh, that is uh, read uh, within Bamu in a different way. Uh, for comparison, I am showing the German Kaiser Wilhelm II um, in his uniform. Uh, you'll see that the uniforms are relatively similar. Uh, kind of in the shape, in the form. Uh, they all have this kind of sash going across the, the chest uh, with a belt around the waist, uh, kind of buttons going down the front. Uh, he has medals kind of hanging uh, across the chest on his shoulders. Uh, epaulets are on all of these examples. Um, the helmet is also replicated in a slightly different way. Uh, that he's kind of enjoy as taking cues from this German uniform. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II um, actually visited Bamun and gifted uh, King Enjoya a portrait of himself. Um, so Enjoya would have actually met this person um, and seen what he was wearing, but also would have owned a portrait of him and been able to see his clothing. Uh, and reference it directly uh, through this portrait too. Um, so he is using these uniforms to express this power to different audiences uh, that is recognize, recognizable as a powerful uniform to these German um, colonizers, but also to his uh, local audiences as well. Um, however, as a result of political shifts, uh, Enjoya and members of his court ceased wearing uh, the beaded uniforms in 1909. Um, this is kind of leading up to the First World War, where uh, Germany is, uh, frankly, ha has bigger fish to fry, um, that the, they're paying less attention to Bamun and giving less aid to Bamun. Uh, so there is some political tension that shifts, uh, and so he and Joya ceases to wear these German-style uniforms uh, and kind of reverts back to his Hausa-style robes. Uh, this adaptation um, is indicative of these kind of political shifts, kind of when he is in favor with the Germans, he is wearing these uniforms, but when he's not, um, he stops wearing them. Um, this adaptation is also uh, an imported style as part of the history of these innovations um, that Enjoya is interested in the styles from somewhere else, which is attested by his adoption of Hausa style robes um, that are coming from outside the moon. So he stops wearing these in 1909, but then in the wake of Germany's defeat in World War I, uh, Cameroon becomes a French colony, so it's no longer even associated with Germany. And the tentative cooperation that had existed between Enjoya and the German authorities was quickly undermined. Uh, Enjoya dies in exile in 1933, so he um, is kind of 
in, on uh, um, he's put on the outs by the French that he he does not have the same relationship with them and is not able to establish that either. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the main points um, in looking in um, into this case study is that these dress practices are always more complex than you may think uh, upon first glance. Uh, I think this is a great example of how cultural authentication can um, be expressed through just one individual. We've looked at just King and Joya, uh, that he is taking inspiration from his neighboring communities, uh, but also the, the Germans. Um, and so his German adoption of these German uniforms is definitely on an individual level, that there, he was not telling his kingdom to wear German style uniforms. He's only doing that for himself. So this is cultural authentication on an individual level. However, his uh, adoption of Hausa style robes is on a community level, that he um, has his uh, entire kingdom transition into um, these loose um, style garments. Uh, so that's a really interesting case where you have uh, individual cultural authentication, but also community uh, in kind of this, the same uh, atmosphere, that these are happening at the same time. Uh, even within this one person's wardrobe, he has uh, quite the range of garments available to him, um, which is because he is the king. He, he is kind of the highest ranking person in the society. Um, so he has access to that and has the, the authority to do that, whereas the people underneath him do not necessarily have that authority. Um, there's a tendency within the field of fashion history uh, to first of all, ignore non-Western fashion systems, uh, which would kind of ignore these uh, shifts in, um, in dress style, uh, that kind of assuming that what people in Bamoon or elsewhere wear what they have worn forever uh, would ignore the the shift to the conversion to Islam and therefore the conversion into their dress um, that this this is still part of fashion uh, despite not being part of a, a European fashion tradition. Um, there's also the assumption that um, non-Western fashion, specifically that in Africa, is stagnant and that it's never changing. And I think I, I've tried to show that today that. Um, we, we can't really categorize the, uh, these house of style robes as traditional to Bamoon because they are already coming from somewhere else. Um, but there is this tendency uh, within uh, the, the history of fa fashion history to call this traditional and call this, um, and mistake it for what they've always worn in this area, which is simply not true. Uh, this is a very recent um, adoption of dress. Uh, so I think taking a closer look um, at each of these case studies can reveal um, a myriad of influences. Uh, even the wardrobe of this one person uh, is not beholden to a single culture, but he's taking inspiration from, from many different cultures. Um, but with that, I think, um, I'd be interested in moving towards questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to be checking the uh, questions and answers. Um, I wanted to open this up to um, our students. Uh, we are interested in your questions. So this is a good time to, to lodge any questions. I know... Um, I know that you are giving us a, a historic, uh, historic perspective on fashion and influence. Um, I'd love to know more about 
I know I would love to know more about the uh, the influence of color and tradition as it melded with uh, these the this seeking of power um, to show power and good questions are coming in. So one of the questions that came in is, do we know uh, the color of the beads and their meaning? Mm, that is a great question. Let me pull up this image. Um, there's a range of colors um, of beads. These beads are made in Europe, uh, most likely coming from somewhere in Italy. Uh, these are glass beads that are traded um, to Africa. And uh, a lot of these, uh, moving kind of backwards in time a little bit, before European trade was established, uh, there was a previous bead practice. And the beads that they were making uh, were these shells, um, but they also made beads out of ostrich eggs uh, or bones. Um, and so most of the beads before European trade would have been white uh, and colored with red ochre or colored with um, different types of kind of natural pigments. So having a much limited, much more limited range of colors. After European trade is established and you get this proliferation of colorful beads, it's really the whole spectrum of colors. Uh, we don't know what Enjoya is wearing on his suit, uh, but we do know this kind of uh, blue and white pattern was very popular, uh, and red is definitely uh, a very significant color. Uh, red is, um, you also have carnelian, which is a red um, uh, bead that's very popular. Uh, so I'd say that these kind of red, blue, and white are, are going to be the most popular at this period. And I'm sure some of the uh, the colors are more expensive to produce um, and sometimes rare. Um, and so thank you for that. Thank you for that. And earlier, you showed us a slide of uh, Najoya and Joya and his two sons. Um, and you mentioned that the uh, son on the right uh, is wearing a very different outfit. Mm -hmm. Could you go into some detail about that? Yeah, um, so this is, uh, well, first I'll say, frankly, we don't know much about dress in Bamoon before Enjoya's rule. Uh, it's just less documented, and he changed it so much that he kind of eradicated what was there previously. But it's thought that an ensemble like this is likely what they were wearing before um, he took power. And what we're seeing is um, a tunic underneath uh, with this kind of dress-like robe on top. So there's kind of these two embroidered straps uh, going over and then kind of cinched at the, the waist with a belt. Um, but this would have been like a layer of a tunic underneath. Um, but frankly, we don't know too much about what was worn previously. Yeah, I noticed that the dress is a little bit more tailored um, mm -hmm. on, on the sun on the right, uh, where it's very um, loose. And it was really interesting how you pointed out how that loose dress um, also represented wealth to be able mm -hmm. to afford these fabrics. Um, and I'm sure that it served a, a practical purpose as well. Um, all right, thank you for that. And we're, of course, seeing uh, the dress of the men. Um, mm -hmm. But did women dress, dress similar to the men? Or did they wear pants? Tell us a, a little bit about that, if this, this is known. Yeah, um, I, I guess I don't have any images of women. I apologize for that. Um, but it is very similar um, that you do see uh, women um, rather than wearing these kind of loose pants, it would have likely been a, a type of skirt or dress with a very similar um, robe on top. Um, the kind of on the surface, it looks the same, um, but underneath, they would likely have had a, a skirt or dress underneath rather than the pants. Um, although the men's pants are very loose and almost kind of look like skirts um, in a way as well. All right. Well, thank you about that. 
And then while we're looking at this really fascinating slide, we you started to talk about uh, King and Joya's throne. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the throne um, and the shapes, what they might signify. Um, there's quite a number of shapes here, um, figures of animals, figures of people, and the people are uh, most likely supposed to represent previous kings, um, so indicating a lineage here. Um, the animals, um, the, the, I believe his actual throne survives maybe in a in a German collection, like a museum that you can maybe see this. I'm not sure if this is the exact one that I'm thinking of, um, but there are um, kind of snakes intertwined. There are leopards. Leopards is, are a very highly prized animal, uh, very difficult to hunt. Uh, so associated with kind of prestige, uh, but the images of previous kings is, is one of the main features here. You see kind of faces going across the bottom as well, uh, that those would be kind of his uh, lineage, uh, establishing himself as king. Um, there is, uh, if you kind of look up his, um, the previous kings, it's actually a very dramatic story um, that uh, one king is slain and they have to retrieve his head um, from a like neighboring kingdom um, that the the German uh, uh, political power, the German soldiers that are um, here at this time actually help retrieve uh, Enjoya's father's head from a neighboring kingdom who stole it and having the head of his father helps establish himself as the ruler, that this is a, an important thing to have as part of kind of the palace, um, that, that you have to have the head of your father to be uh, identified as the king. Uh, so the, the Germans established their relationship with Enjoya by helping him uh, retrieve that from these neighboring kingdoms. It's kind of a, a strange, uh, drama that goes on there. All right, thank you so much. And we're getting some really good questions coming in. Um, one question uh, takes us back to the Madras you mm. showed at the beginning of the talk. And so this is, this is a term I remember. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about when the Madras material infiltrated to the United States? Yeah, um, this is a, also a really interesting story that it comes from the transatlantic slave trade, um, that this is uh, first traded in Africa. Uh, so you get um, uh, the Igbo people here wearing madras, uh, and then they, these people are enslaved, and they take this tradition with them to the Americas. Uh, so they start wearing um, these plaid cloths um, and continue making them. Uh, and as trade is established with the Americas, uh, there is a, a large market for Indian madras, um, both for enslaved people, but also for uh, the new colonies that are there. Uh, the Europeans are also desiring this cloth. Um, I think it's also um, Brooks Brothers uh, is established in New York City. and. Um, uh, again, another uh, popular trade destination, and they start making shirts with these um, textiles, and that becomes this kind of preppy look. Um, it comes from this kind of uh, uh, trade across the world um, in conjunction with the slave trade, and it becomes um, uh, a symbol of freedom for um, when a, a, an enslaved person gains their freedom, they wear these textiles very proudly, and it becomes a symbol of freedom for them as well. So there's kind of these multiple stories happening at the same time. 
Wonderful. I wonder also if, if color uh, plays a role in its significance um, as the beads, or do we know anything about that? Um, these come in such a range of colors that I think um, a lot of it is dependent on fashion and what colors are fashionable at a time. Uh, I mean, nowadays we think of what colors are in season. Um, and I, it, that is true of most of history, that colors kind of come in and out of fashion. Uh, specifically uh, with the madras that end up in Africa, um, they do have a preference for specific colors, um, uh, specifically with the Igbo people, that they um, are likely uh, only obtaining uh, madras that are made of blue and red. Um, and then once we get into these examples, um, I think I mentioned that some people cut just the light colored threads and some people are cutting the darker colored threads. Mm -hmm. And this is often indicating um, either family affiliation or um, kind of a subsect of the Calabari people that you kind of identify where somebody's from based on which color threads they're cutting. Or it, it could be kind of a family affiliation that you're part of this clan and therefore you only cut the light colored threads. You could be from another clan and only cut the dark colored threads. And you, you showed us um, the original madras in an earlier slide. You've got a good question from uh, another student here with us. Um, can you describe how the cut fabric was made from the madras fabric? The re results look so, appear so different from the original. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's totally transformed when they start cutting these threads, but they start with a needle. So you can imagine just like uh, any sewing needle and they pull these individual threads from the cloth. Um, you can kind of see the weave, but they, they pull them out and then cut them. And they do that um, in these patterns uh, it's a very, very delicate process. Um, it's very time consuming. Uh, and that's why these textiles are so, um, ha have such high status associated with them because of the labor that goes into them. Um, but yeah, you can, I, I hope you can see kind of the individual uh, structure of the weave here, um, that they're really taking a needle and just picking it apart and then cutting the loose threads. They look very labor intensive. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, were they terribly expensive? Uh, going back, as you mentioned, um, they took off and I'm trying to remember when you just explained this slide, this was uh, back in the, I think you mentioned the 16th century. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but were they terribly expensive or widely worn? Uh, tell us about the cost factor or who who could wear these cloths. So in India, um, madras has been made since the 1500s. Um, and in India, it's relatively cheap. Um, it's only once it's traded somewhere else that it becomes much more expensive and much more valuable. I don't have a good kind of cost equivalent, um, but th this is seen as kind of common cloth. Um, at this time uh, in India, whereas it becomes much more precious elsewhere. Yeah, I don't really have a good like number equivalency for that, but no. Okay, yeah, fascinating. And we have another question now taking us to the present. Um, mm -hmm. what, is, what is happening now with global fashion now in 2023? Um, what, what are the trends that you see if we can shift to the now. Mm. And I mean, that's such a difficult question, um, but a good one. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of influence from the internet that there is no longer um, fashion trends that are separate from anywhere else in the world, um, that it is much more 
I hate to use the word flattened, but there's kind of a, a more equivalency. Uh, I think there's more accessibility to global trends. Uh, globalization has made things more accessible to more people. Um, but at the same time, um, in a lot of kind of non-Western places like Africa, um, there is a pushback against uh, Western style clothing. Um, the, there's kind of a movement to reclaim uh, indigenous dress styles. Uh, and some places that's successful, some places that's not. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how the future, I don't know what the future will hold, um, but I, I think it's interesting that um, as more places become uh, more independent and more empowered, that there's a recognition that dress is important and that uh, relying on European or American fashion trends uh, is not satisfactory for many places um, that may have embraced it uh, 50 years ago and are no longer embracing that. Yeah, we're and we're so we have such richness because of that. Yeah. And so um, I have a few comments. Um, we're now this is going back to the talk you were, you know, we, when you you were telling us about Enjoya and and this is just a comment it looks like were there any so-called rebel fashion uh, fashionists or fashionistas during this period of time in Africa um, in what were the individual thoughts or interpretations of thought even at the tribal level hmm that is interesting um I, I would say yes. Um, there are always people who um, dress against the norm, um, whether or not they're documented or uh, celebrated or um, yeah. it's often kind of ostracized because of it, that there are always people who uh, don't subscribe to the norm. Um, I can't, I'm not thinking of, um, someone from like Van Moon specifically, but there are uh, people known as Sepkers who I think come from more central Africa. Uh, and these are men who could be seen as kind of the African equivalent of the dandy, that they're dressing in these outrageous, uh, colorful suits. Um, they uh, are criticized for spending all their money on clothing. Um, and kind of dress against the norm in that way and kind of push against uh, local traditions and dress. Um, but that that's a, a slightly different area or region from what I, I mentioned. Sure, and it, I guess it depends too on documentation, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, King and Joya uh, adopted the camera. Uh, mm -hmm. He's very technologically advanced. Uh, we have that benefit of documentation. Um, it's, and I was just kept thinking, it's unfortunate we didn't have color photography available. Mm -hmm. We would see those colors. Well, this is really interesting. You've got another comment um, um, thanking you for this information on the progression of traditional dress to contemporary times. Um, and just a question from, a, I thought that was a really good question. Do you remember when Telfer Clemens created Liberia's 2000 Olympic team dress with traditional garb, and it made a great state, a statement of power. So this mm. is just a, a comment, um, but you know, thank you for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can't think of that off the top of my head, but I think there's um, there there are always times when um, putting on traditional dress is um, there are times when people do it and when people don't do it. Uh, and I think that says a lot about um, the politics of the time and um, uh, what message are they trying to send when dressing up in more traditional garb? Because um, it, it's not always that that's done. It, it's a very um, thoughtful and intentional act a lot of times. 
And that's a, a great example. So thank you, Mary. I uh, have a couple of uh, other questions. Uh, we still have a little bit of time here. Um, we send a lot of our clothing to Africa and other countries. How are other people accepting these items? And I think by we, we are uh, exporting uh, clothing. So how, how is that acceptance? And that was a, a question that just came in. Yeah, I honestly don't know too much about um, that system, but I do know um, for some communities, um, it, it's often uh, detrimental to some of the local uh, cloth production, garment production, that they, because um, kind of the US and other countries have sent uh, donations of used clothing or un, unsold clothing to different parts of Africa that uh, African cultures have become reliant on those uh, donations and then cannot can no longer support local production of clothing. Um, uh, but at the same time, there are some places where that is um, necessary, that they wouldn't have clothing otherwise. Um, so it, it's, it, it is a very complex issue. And um, I don't know, I don't feel totally qualified to, to talk about it much, much more than that. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, wondering if we can go back to that slide of King and Joya on the throne. Uh, a more specific question came in about that. Um, mm -hmm. That throne, as and I really enjoyed your description of the throne. It's beautifully decorated. Um, these are functional items, but are there any decorative or spiritual items that are also richly decorated? Hmm. Um, there are um, often figures. So we are actually seeing some of the figures behind him. Uh, these can be uh, placed at altars, um, placed at the palace. So we see them kind of with amongst the structure of the palace, which is behind him, uh, also in this image as well. Um, these uh, are not, they don't seem to be covered in beads, although maybe this one might have some beads on it. Um, again, um, a lot of these figures are likely depicting uh, the royal family, depicting previous kings, um, or um, can also be used as uh, substitutes for people. So there's a tradition, uh, if you're like praying to um, an altar of some sort that you would have a figure of yourself uh, placed there uh, when you're not able to, you, you can't be in the the altar all, the whole time. So you place a figure of yourself in in the altar. Um, and then I think I also showed uh, this mask um, here too. Um, that masks are often worn in different kinds of celebrations um or or dances um masks are something that are not worn every day but kind of have a ceremonial purpose all right well thank you for that and then a really good question um as we wrap up our talk although we have a couple more questions um let's see oh um by the way uh one student did a little bit of research while you were talking and that throne can still be seen in the Berlin Ethnological Museum. Yes, I thought it was somewhere in Germany. <laughs> yeah, now we know. Thank you for that, Susan. So let's talk about sustainability, if we can. Mm, yeah. um, do, do you think sustainability will begin to supersede fashion at some point? Mm, supersede, I think, is the wrong word. Okay. I think. Um, sustainability will be fashion at some point. Um, I think we're moving towards a, a world with slow fashion where um, people 
are finding interesting ways to mend clothing, uh, to wear it longer, uh, to purchase uh, maybe more expensive clothing that's made in a more durable way. Um, but sustainability, I don't think will ever, um, what was the word, supersede fashion? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't I don't think that I think fashion is um, a human necessity the the we we have to have uh, some way of uh, expressive decoration on our bodies uh, and that that is uh, this kind of innate drive of humans to feel uh, different and express individuality um, and I think that is fashion, and I think that is part of the system of change over time. Right. Thank you for that. Well, this has been a, a fascinating talk. I, I really want to thank you, Samuel Snodgrass, for joining us today for a global perspective on, on fashion and the history of fashion. This is such a, a deep area to to plumb. Um, I'm looking forward to finding out more. I, I'm hoping that this um, this touches off other questions. And let's keep the conversation going. Um, for this class, we also have a discussion um, on the module. So um, thank you for that. Uh, and we'll we'll continue the conversation. You can also reach out to Eva Marie, my colleague, uh, who will be uh, talking about the the uh, program that we had today. Uh, but I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and also for your great questions. Um, next week, uh, Eva Marie will be back and we have more talks. Um, so thank you for joining us on this Friday morning. And thank you so much, um, Samuel, for the, your talk this morning. Thank you.